episode on Friday, May 10th with the great Ryan Divish of the Seattle Times brought to you by Chalet Bowl, Washington's oldest operating bowling alley established in 1941, located in Tacoma's Proctor District. Visit them at chaletbowl.com to make your next reservation. If you're watching this right now and you can't really tell where he's at, listening on all the platforms, Divish, uh, We'll go into your travel escapades here in a moment. We find you where right now here on Friday morning. I am in Minneapolis at the um, the United Club. Now you can hear somebody making an announcement in here. Okay, you're at the United Club. Don't go into golf voice. I'm not. <laughs> Who cares if people can hear you? Shout it. Shout everything that you want to shout right now. These people don't care. Yeah, but then I'll, I'll be dropping F-bombs and stuff like that, too. And I mean, like, you know, I'll be that guy. I, you know, it's already bad enough. Like, there are people talking in the speakerphones and stuff like that. So, it's, yeah. yeah, you know, those people are never under age 65, I might add. <laughs> you know what annoys me about people real quick is the is the um like in the grocery store driving around or walking around like with their carts and they got the earbuds in you can't tell especially like women if they got their hair down you're like and they start talking like are you talking to me like what, what are you asking and like oh no no you, you're on some separate conversation that, that annoys me uh, it's pretty safe to say no woman's talking to me either unless they're saying uh get away from me you're frightening me so <laughs> no i don't have to worry about that sorry i also sound probably why i sound funny is because like my you this sound okay. A, you just you're doing your Jim Nance like on. Well, the no, hole. there's been a pollen bomb dropped in the city of Minneapolis, and it's killing me. Oh, I, it's killing no me a little bit. Yeah, it's there's no, there's no amount of Zyrtec and nasal spray I could take to make myself feel better. Yeah, just pull the microphone a little away. You're popping a little bit. You're fine. You're good. You got you you got you got the pollen. You're inside the United Airlines. You know the lounge. Your flight got canceled. That's why you're in the lounge right now. Yeah, I got up at uh, four and, oh, um, for a seven a.m. flight, and it was canceled. And the best uh, part was, it didn't get canceled till I got through security, checked my bag. Like I couldn't, and I I weighed going back to the airport or back to my hotel. Yeah, so I still had the key, but it would have been like eighty dollars worth of Uber, and I just was like, screw it. So how long do you have to stay there? Uh, my flight's at two twenty. And the best part is, is that when I land in Seattle at about 4.30, President Biden's landing at about 5. So I may never get to the park tonight. Well, what's Adam Jude doing? We, we're calling well, Jude. We're going Jude off the bench here well, out of the bullpen. There. He's currently trying to figure out some stuff on Julio, I guess. And then uh, he's he's got to go do the Justin Hollander talking about injuries thing before the game. So Okay. Can you so, text him to ask uh, if he, if if Julio wants to hit third? <laughs> Dinosaur. Can you? Get, rex I'm you? gonna. You know what? I'm gonna text him. You're like a I'm baby like, T Rex. I am like a baby T Rex. I like it. I I appreciate it. All right. So that was. I mean, I'm I'm kind of half paying attention to the game on Thursday. I mean, that was an ass whooping. Like yeah. I mean, like take you outside the shed and beat you down. That was a suck fest. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, it didn't have to be if, uh, you know, Manny Margot's hitting 156 and they're knocking on the door of DFAing him when they get another outfielder healthy. When Buxton comes back or Royce Lewis, they may DFA Manny Margot. And, of course, base is loaded. He throws a splitter that just doesn't really split or sink. And Margot was the blind squirrel theory, pulled one down the line. And... um you know, one thing that I didn't like, and I don't know that he would have just caught it, but uh, Urias didn't even dive. He had a dive there to try and knock it down mm. to keep it on the dirt. That saves a couple runs. He didn't do that, and I think the catcher gave him the death stare for about 15 to 20 seconds staring down at third base. Like, why didn't you dive for that? So, um, Yeah, you see, because you, you, you compare. I mean, that's two different – hold on. This is two different games, two different athletes, right? But I'm sure you've seen the highlight of of Bobby Witt the other day, running, uh, covering 115 feet to go yeah. from shortstop to go and get a ball that probably the left fielder should have caught, or yeah. even the third baseman, and he makes the catch in foul territory. It was it's amazing. So you see that guy's effort, and then you see that you compare it to uh, Urias yesterday. Yeah, that's. I mean, like 
that's a thing though. These guys were due for clunkers at some point. Like you know that they're going to not always be outstanding. You know, you can't throw a quality start every time out. But every once in a while, the offense got to pick them up. They did it once on this series, but I mean, there's nothing to say that they will. And it was like a, a perfect storm. I mean, this is a team that strikes out. Like the Mariners strike out. We know. I mean, apparently, people think they need to tell me that the Mariners strike out a lot, as if I don't know. Um, <laughs> but like, so yeah, they're, they're just they're... making sure that you're up to date on all the strikeout numbers. That's it. Yeah, I, uh, well, in between that and trying to fill out job applications for all the hitting coaches and stuff, um, so and like, the and the and the offensive coordinator, yeah. yeah. So like, um, and I totally lost my train of thought there. Uh, I just the the oh the, no, like the, yeah. So like, it's a perfect storm. These guys strike out a lot. At least they're on a run where they're striking out a lot, and they're facing pitchers. The team that strikes out more batters per nine innings than any team in baseball. So it's like okay. You know, they shouldn't. People shouldn't be surprised that they strike out ten times at least in every game. That's that's a given. You know, it's when they strike out ten times or fifteen times in a game when a guy that's a thumber, you know, tossing salad up there and not, you know, real real pitcher. That's when hey, you have to be concerned. I'm I'm ignorant. A thumber? Yeah, just flipping it with your thumb up there. You know, okay. like or you know like the salad tossing has got a lot of different innuendos but like somebody <laughs> well, says yeah we don't need that, we can go into them what they if yeah, what no, they mean on this not. platform if you but like like um <laughs> some guys throw so slow that they don't even throw meat they throw salad okay all right so i mean i heard that one I'm, the thumber though that's a new yeah. one i mean it's an old school one probably but a new one a new one for uh, me well i mean you're right about that i mean i think these pitchers they they'll never admit it to you on the record, I'm sure they probably have shared it with you guys privately, mm-hmm. uh, but they have to feel it and, and and wear it. They they probably put so much pressure on themselves that every fifth day they take the ball, they probably say to themselves, right, like the Stuart Smalley SNL skit, you know, looking in the mirror, I've got you know, I've got to be perfect today, or yeah, I mean- we're not going to win. Those are positive affirmations. Yeah. These guys aren't even like positive affirmations. It's just walking out there going, all right, if I give up two runs, we're going to It's over. Yeah. It's like, I mean, like I I posted that thing. They're 13 and 13 in the the games where they've struck out double digits. One of the, in those 13 wins, like eight of them, they allowed two runs or fewer. That's crazy. Three runs or fewer. I mean, that's, that's the difference. You know, it's, their pitching has been so good. So it's just like last year. Their pitching had been so good for the entire season, even in the month of August when like they, the offense was still so good. The pitching was outstanding. And then, you know, they hit a lull in September and, you know, that basically tanked it. So um, I don't know. I mean, like I, I knew it was coming and that <clears throat> the twins are hot right now. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like everything they hit, they hit hard, they hit square. You know? And they, it's funny too, like people hate the platoons and everything like that, but that's all the twins do. You know, like Jeffers, he, he's just scalding balls all over. And all of a sudden, like, nope, you're getting pinch hit for for Trevor Larnick. You know, mm-hmm. you're like, wow, this is crazy. But that's what they do. That's how they play. That's how their, their roster is designed. And then, like, everybody's like, oh, it must be nice to see a team that never strikes out. I'm going, the Twins set the record for most strikeouts of a season, you dimwits. <laughs> like, oh, well, they're not this year. Well, yeah, they also just got done playing the White Sox uh... for seven games and the Angels for three. I mean, yeah. like, they when they won 12 games. Ten of them were against the White Sox and Angels. Hey, did you get your eyes on the sausage at all? No, I didn't see it. Uh, the, it's back, go... right? They 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 had the winning streak snapped, and then thought it was going away. But then, so I think I read someplace where it didn't, and then they brought it back out. Was it against the Mariners? And they they ended up getting those runs. And I was that I can't even remember what what game that was. The second game, maybe in the series, and they yeah, rallied I... to win. And so now, is it back on the? In the you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time talking about uh, the t- baseball player's sausage. Oh, well, lucky sausage. Did you touch um, it? No. It's like still my one of my favorite Angie lines, Angie Mentic lines of all time is when Alex Liddy hit the Grand Slam. She goes, there's nothing like a big Italian salami. And I about <laughs> had a heart attack. <laughs> oh, we got we to gotta find that audio. Alex Liddy. That's, I don't, you know what? Now I, I vaguely remember that. I mean. I got to, we got to find, I mean, the best one's Nicole. Yeah. Know, I mean, I was Loomis, working but... that game when I heard Nicole, like we're in the clubhouse <sighs> and we heard the interview because Brandon came in and goes, guys, you got to hear this interview. 
I got the sound bite. I mean, someplace I'll 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 find it and we'll throw it up there. That's that's how do you like the two hole? Just never yeah, gets old. Like just never ever ever gets old. Alex, because Alex, his laugh is what makes it. Yeah. <laughs> the Alex Liddy <laughs> dropped though on the thousand Mariners. The you know with the thousand Mariners. Like man, they they when they put that tweet out with all the names of the thousand Mariners, I'm like, oh my god, some oh. of the guys I cover. That's why when people sit there and say, oh, this is one of the worst rosters and this and that. I'm like. Dude, uh-huh. I come in 2010, 11. Yeah. Like when you have like Jack Cust and Trayvon Robinson and Eric Thames and all these guys. Come on now. Oh God, Jack Cust, Ronnie Sedano. Yeah, there guys. were some bad. There were some bad dudes. All right. So the strikeouts, right? We know we we know what they just strike out a lot. What what I don't get, and I looked at this up to, uh, this morning on Fangraphs. So they have five of the top ten American League. Mm-hmm. Uh, leaders in strikeout percentage. And three of them are guys that they acquired, like mm-hmm. that were their three biggest acquisitions in the offseason, Mitch Hanniger, yeah. Mitch Garver, and Jorge Polanco. I mean, you have, the other two are, are Cal and Julio, but that's what they are. And they mm-hmm. just, that's, they strike out a bunch. They acquired these guys, as you know, and people watching and listening know, to combat that. Why is it, though, that year after year, and I think we've probably had this discussion before, and I, I don't know what the answer is. Why year after year do they acquire these guys who don't have a history of striking out, and then they come here and they strike out a bunch? I mean, I, we've talked about the pressure of the ballpark. I mean, at some point, I, I don't know if it's the coaching because they've changed the hitting instructors and they've added people like, who is it now? Jarrett DeHart is the hitting coach, the director of hitting strategy. Then Tommy Joseph is the assistant hitting coach. Who's the offensive coordinator? Brant Brown. Okay. <clears throat> so they, they they have changed that up. But is it does it have to be like their overall like organizational philosophy on hitting need to be just completely revamped? Because why are these guys coming here with no history of striking out at this rate? Especially like look at Polanco. What was his career like 18%? Yeah. And now yeah. he's almost he's almost doubled it. Uh, well, like, you know, Handiger, I mean, he struck out 28% of the time last year. He's striking out 30% of the time this year, 26% in his, in his, uh, 2022 season when he hit 31 or when he hit, you know, 11 bombs, he was hurt. Um, you know, he had a 28 or he had a 29% season in 2019. So, I mean, like he's trended up towards strikeouts. Let me look at, um, Polanco's. Polanco had more last year, I think, a higher percentage in his career. So I think sometimes people sit there and say, oh, well, <clears throat> yeah, see, last year he struck out 25.7. So, you know, 6% higher is a lot. But, like, so to some people, everybody's like, oh, well, why do they get worse when they come here? Well, Cano didn't get worse. Nelson Cruz didn't get worse. Mm. Technically, Mitch Hanniger got better when he first came here the first time. You okay, know, Segura, but but those but Cruz and Cano though aren't they were this established. Uh, yes, but not this but not this organization though. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying is they didn't come, they didn't get bad when they got here. True. Yeah, you, know, you know Segura, he came here had a 300 season. You know, pissed off everybody, but like to me, it's like sometimes it's about <clears throat> when you get these guys. It's like when you got Adam Frazier, you get Colton Wong. Even like Polanco, some of these guys, I think sometimes like the mindset of trying to prove that they're, you know, because the Mariners a lot of times are buying them on the rebound or they're buying them in the walk year or whatever. I think that sometimes plays into it. I don't, and I, like, to me, it's like everybody sits there and talks about strategy and the organizational philosophy. Like, do you think these guys really worry about that when they step into the batter's box? And they're like, oh man, we got to, you know, like at the end of the day, the plate appearance is theirs. It's not like, it doesn't belong to Jarrett DeHart or Brant Brown or the Mariners or the control of the zone. Like you think like Hanniger goes up there and he says, Oh man, you know what? I was just so, just so pumped up to control the zone that I smashed this three, one fastball. I mean, like, come on. Like, I, I never invoke my college playing days very much, but there's, but, but this is well, okay. Time out. This is the second straight show you have though. Well, I just said there's not one time where I ever, <laughs> where I ever struck out and blamed my hitting coach. Okay, but but I okay yes, and and I and I get where you're coming from. But what they spent an entire off season, like the number one focus was cutting down on this. No, no, the number one focus was well, cutting was the payroll. Cutting payroll. Yeah. That's right. This is a payroll. convenient way of justifying some of the moves. 
It was cutting the money to get in. Like, and they never said like they were gonna low. They they wanted to lower it some. They didn't want to strike out as much. They never said they were gonna have a low one. Luke Rayleigh has a high strikeout percentage. If you think about it, if you extrapolate out Mitch Garver, if you you know if you push out Garver to, is what like he was in that twenty six percent range. Yeah, yeah. If you push those guys out, it's not like it, this is unheard of what they're doing. To me, the bigger problem is is you have one of your guys that doesn't strike out a lot, J.P. Crawford, who was striking out some. He's mm-hmm. not in the lineup, you know, because Dylan Moore does strike out. Like he he does strike out even when he's good. He'll strike out some, and then like. France, who didn't used to strike out, is striking out more. Cal and Julio have not lowered their strikeout percentage at all. So you've added guys that have gone up a tick. But what's happened is, is when you know you're in a funk as a whole with a team where everybody's not hitting and everybody looks at their numbers and they're trying to do more. Yeah, because like like everybody talks about the strategy or whatever, the, the control of the zone thing is just like, hey, get a good pitch to hit and hit it hard. Like, just don't you know? And and like obviously they're not following it. I mean, Julio's the prime example. Like, the whole control the zone is swing at fastballs where you know you can drive them and hit them hard. And he's up there, you know, swinging at fastballs that are going to hit him and then chasing curveballs away. So, no, I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that, like, the, you know, they do all these meetings and they have all this information. And maybe it is a little paralysis by analysis. But, like, to me, it's not, it's not the philosophy. You know, it's like, it'd be like... But yeah, it's oh, like let me, me, like me stop you there. My putter. It's like me blaming my putter and the ball when I jack one by. Like, no, I'm a terrible putter because I don't practice or I don't do it right or I'm a total mental case. I mean, like that's, you know, I don't, I don't get the whole hey, strategy. Get the woman, get the woman a cough, uh, a cough drop that yeah. keeps coughing. I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's <clears throat> and at the end of the day, it comes down to execution. You know, like we talk. Is about it player stuff. acquisition? Let me ask, then stop. I mean, because it's you. You talk about the, you go on the cheap. So when you go on the cheap and acquire people, yeah. you're going to get worse players. Yeah, you're not bringing duh. in prime Mookie bets. So so it's player acquisition then. A little bit, yeah, because you're you're buying players that are somewhat flawed. They be coming to you like that's why they're available. That's why they're home. available, and that's why they cost yeah. what they cost. Yeah, I mean, like I think, you know. I talked to a lot of scouts and were really surprised about Jesse Winker in the sense that how, how too, truly terrible he was. But they also said right away, is like, he's not going to hit as much because he's not in Cincinnati. He's not in the NL Central. You know, the difference is, the difference is with like Hanniger, Garver. It's fine if you can strike out if you hit some homers, you hit some doubles. Right. You're not hitting any. It's all just, no. you know, and Hanniger, I thought Hanniger, it was funny, but this is the thing about Hanniger. This is where the age creeps in a little bit. It's like you play him the fourth day. He looks tired, you know, like because he, he's just because he puts in the work. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you this see is, like the one game he had the he had the homer and another sack fly looked really good. The next day he looked a little tired. The third day in a row, it's like, hey, he's banged up a little bit. It looks like, you know, this is why I do, and we, I know I don't know when it was like a few episodes ago. We talked about this. I just don't understand why they don't put a first baseman's glove in him. Yeah, in his well, locker <clears throat> just go play first base because listen man we you and i and a lot of people it really really enjoy ty france as a person mm-hmm. he's a great dude and there is no, he no one can complain that he didn't put in the work this off season because he did but sometimes yeah. it just right i mean divish you and i can put in all the work we want to be you know good at what we do but here's the reality we're just not going to be good yeah. okay I, well, I wouldn't put in the work. So, I mean, like, <laughs> so but like, like but, with France, it's just like. But this he, has been going on since August of 2022. Yeah, and he, but the the changes and stuff, he's starting to revert back to some of the stuff that got him in trouble in the first place. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. Like with Hanniger, look. Just why? Why not just him. give him a first baseman? Well, Garver's glove played. Garver's played first base. Okay, before. but but okay, but I. And he could play there too, but just yeah. let keep him at DH and just if the days that you don't, because I'm with you, like you have Hanniger because of his bat, mm-hmm. like and he hasn't really been all that good in defense out there in right field anyway. So just give him a first baseman glove, save his legs, and get him from not running around all the time. Yeah, I think they're just gonna be. I think they're gonna. We'll see some stuff maybe in the next. They'll wait a little bit longer. I get teams react differently than fans do i mean well obviously they don't fire everyone after every bad game but like, (laughs) no but i mean like with ty and everything else you know that's an investment for the season that's money you know if you dfa him you're losing that money you do that 
So how's he, how's he dealt with this? Cause I mean, you know, it's right, Ryan, it's gotta be for these guys. And I, I just can't even imagine, you know, they, they, and I don't think the, the fans don't get it. And I'm, you know, I'm throwing myself in there as well as a fan. Like you just don't get like how hard effort and time and money and resources these guys put in, in the off season to get better or to improve in whatever areas they need to improve on. None of us do that. Like in our job, we don't spend the, you know, we don't really have an off season, right? You're not going someplace to get better at computer programming or writing. I mean, maybe some people do this kind of stuff or, or broadcasting. I don't go like, well, two weeks, I'm going to go to this broadcasting school and I'm going to work with this broadcasting guru to get better at broadcasting. I mean, no, no those people are losers. <laughs> get a life you know yeah. but these but, guys right. but these guys do that and so when you think oh my god it's and you see the results like uh when he was working a drive line i'm feeling better maybe i've changed my diet i'm in better shape all this stuff and then you get in the season and then you're not getting the results and as you say you revert back to what you're doing it's just uh, i can only imagine in this brutal brutal long game that is baseball it has just got to wear you down how how is he held up uh, I don't think he's loving life by any means, you know, and I, I don't think any of them are really. I mean, unless you're Rojas or maybe Cal, you're happy. And Cal is not ever happy because he wears everybody else's failures on him. So, no, I don't think anybody should be happy in there. And that's what Hanniger said last night. He says, it looks, you know, the strikeouts are bad. is because when you have six guys struggling at six or seven guys struggling at once, that's why it looks bad. You know, if you're, if you have a bunch, you have three or four guys that are going well and only four are struggling, then your strikeout numbers are down, you know? And, and the problem is now in the modern day of hitting, when you're struggling, it's swing and miss. Cause you're going to swing and miss some, even when you're going good. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's different, but like, yeah, I, I think with Ty, it's just pitch, pitch selection, pitch intent or swing intent. You know, he's, kind of gotten pull happy a little bit and it's just the same with julio but that's what happens you, you start chasing results i mean these guys are human and like you said you know you, you these this is their job they go there they get their you know they get their noon one o'clock for a seven o'clock game they spend all this time getting their body ready then they go hit and they take hundreds of swings trying to get ready and you know trying to find that feeling that it's going to be successful then they go out against the best in the world and get it shoved up their rear and then they feel like crap you know and it's like and then they're embarrassed and that's the one thing like people sit there and say like oh these guys don't care or they make lots of money nobody they don't want to be embarrassed they don't yeah. want to fail because these guys haven't failed so it's like it was funny like dylan moore talked about getting to play finally he's like every one of us when we were come, growing up, we played every single game, every single inning, because mm -hmm. we were the best player on our team. Mm -hmm. And now when you get to the big leagues, you don't get to play all the time. And it sucks. And it's like the same thing. These guys are used to success and used to competing and grinding and having the work they put in, you know, show results. So when you're putting in all this work and then you don't get the results, that's when you do something kind of out of the out of what you should be doing, out of your process, as they call it. You know? well, the process. Do you have a process, process every day? Well, it starts with coffee and then a movement, but I mean, like back in the do day, we, do we go straight chew. black or do we add oh, yeah. some creamer to it? No. Okay. Back in the day when I used to chew though, it was like coffee oh, and Copenhagen. Do... It was oh. like you were together. So, yeah. You, oh, were, Jesus. you were right. Physically. What were 30 done. seconds? What, what, what was the 90 seconds before we got to the bathroom? Uh, you know, I mean, never more than two minutes. <laughs> Oh dear Lord, uh, God! I I got I lost my train of thought. Where I was gonna I was gonna ask you next. Oh, I know what I was gonna do. Uh, so for, so back to first base. We talked about Hanniger, you know, maybe Garver. Do you you mentioned it? I think in the paper today, and just writing about. It, do you think you're gonna see more Luke Rayleigh over there? I mean, you might maybe give Ty a few days to clear his head and kind of reset. Like you know, if they want, send him out to driveline, have him retest, do all mm -hmm. the stuff check his swing speed, check what to see. You know, they have all the slow-mo motion capture stuff. Put them on it. Like, I know players that went there mid-season. I mean, Winker famously went really? there mid -season. Yeah. Huh. Just to do the testing because they can do the motion capture and they, they they do the force plates and stuff and major inefficiencies. I mean, Winker went there mid-season, supposedly, when he was in Seattle and they tested out. And they, they said that he had the swing speed of a high-level high school player and was stronger than most low-level Division One kids. 
So, hey, do you know the guy? You know what? Can you set it? Let's you and I go there and do it. Oh, and then yeah. we'll take the shirts off and we'll get it all plugged in. Remember when you did that? Remember when you did the, what was it? The workout test for the times? How long uh, ago was I that? I did the Mariners team physical and the I team had to do physical. the cardio that, stress test. Yeah. That no, was we'll, great. We'll be doing that again. That was one of the best. One of the best you things you ever did. My shirt on. Well, you so. think you, what about me? Well, no, I, I don't mind it. If you're going to have your, not have your shirt on, then I'll take mine off. I'll yeah, because like, you'll look so much better. I'll look like an Adonis, you know? <laughs> All right, it was, uh, I can't even remember which game it was now, uh, but the George Kirby getting pulled again, I mean, it, it seemed weird because it just seemed kind of confusing again one more time, and it's just not, it's not just fans, it, it, it felt, I mean, it felt like broadcasters, I mean, I'm watching, Mike Blowers is like, I, I don't really get it, like, what's yeah. what's going on? Um, what is going, is, is there something there? I mean, it, it, he says he's fine. No injury, but well, I, th- I think part of it was he just wasn't very good, and so they're yeah. like, "Well, what you know, if he if he don't have it, let's not make it worse." You know what I mean? Like he, huh. everything was just kind of wasn't you know kind of. Well, look at Gilbert yesterday; he wasn't very good either. But mm-hmm. also, they didn't pull him; they left him because they didn't want to kill their bullpen because they like have no off days, and they know they need bullpen today because Wu is starting today. Yeah. So it was like they didn't, they left Logan in and Logan Ward, you know, he's kind of a horse, but like, I think with George, like there's some concern one, if it's a knee injury and, and, you know, it's bothering him, you don't want him like doing something on the mound that can affect his arm, you know, cause we've seen that happen before where a guy mm-hmm. will have a leg injury and they're trying to make through and then they hurt their arm. That's the last thing you want to do. So I think, you know, sometimes in the course of the season too, like if, if you just have a clunker, and you can get away with not having to use it, especially because he's dealing with stuff. Get him out. What's the purpose of it? You know, I mean, like I everybody and it's cool sometimes when a guy has a bad outing and they wear it for the bullpen and such. It's fine when you're Jared Washburn and nobody cares if you make the next start. But like with George Kirby, <laughs> you don't do that. You know, you don't. You don't. Was you, Jared Washburn not a fan favorite? Not a not a not, a not a not a teammate I, favorite. I got along with him, but he, you know, I like Jared he, Washburn. Yeah, I got along with him great, but other people didn't like him. So, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, no, it's not like Bedard. Others liked him more. Bedard, if he, and, you know, Bedard have a bad out and get me out of here, man. I got to get up to Cap Hill and start pounding beers. <laughs> All right, so there are thirty-eight games uh, in at uh, twenty and eighteen as we record this here on Friday. They start a series with the A's, and um, at at what point though do they get to where? I mean, is it is fifty games that they start? evaluating do you do you do you envision them being um if they are going to do something as we get closer you know to the deadline which again is months away do you think that they will try and strike early if they continue to kind of be where they're at right now they're they're still very much in it no one's pulling away in the west or a game enough behind texas as as we record this right now do you think jerry and and justin will try to be proactive well obviously i think they they will be they should be like they're what are they two games over 500 they're what a game out of the west yeah game and a game yeah. out of the west with an offense that is that hasn't underperformed it's barely it's been it done anything at time yeah so it's like you have a winning record and you haven't done anything offensively or anything close to what you project to do offensively yeah of course you do plus you're getting jp back you're getting uh Wu back you know, maybe you'll get Santos back in a, in about three or four weeks. You don't know. I mean, like you're getting better, you know, and, and you have a better gauge of what you have in AAA and really what you have at the big league level. So I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, I, I think that the, that's the 50 game mark is usually when you've self-scouted yourself enough to know what you need or don't need. And you go from there. And I mean, it, it might not just always be player acquisition. Like I wrote, like. Maybe they go with because when you know they get healthy enough, when JP comes back, then you can play Dylan Moore in the outfield. Mm-hmm. So do they go Luke Rayleigh at first base when they run at a straight platoon? You know, could they do that? You know, Rayleigh's starting to hit a little bit, and the one thing he does offer uh, is speed on the bases. You know, he's not he can run and he can do some stuff. Ty is a better defensive player, so no, like people are talking about Tyler Locklear. Like I know Jerry loves him and stuff, but like. You talk to other people defensively; it would be very bad for him to come up. And he's played, he's had a hundred games at the double A. Well, what do you what do you do though? Who do you start to target if you if you start looking? Or you talk to enough scouts around baseball? 
I mean, you, you just got to go look at the standings, right? And go, all right, yeah. who's going to be out of it soon, right? I mean, there's Giants, there's Giants, Giants Rockies, Marlins, White Sox, uh, White Sox, you know, but like the White Sox suck. And Cardinals, really good players, yeah. Um, what about Toronto? That's interesting. What about Vlad? <laughs> They're not going to get rid of him. You don't think so? I don't know. The I mean, I I, I wouldn't if I were them. They'd be crazy. But I mean, there's been talk in Toronto of them them just exploring the idea. I mean, he's he'll be what a free agent in 25, I believe. Yeah, because they don't think they can resign him. Or yeah, they, they want to spend that much money because he is kind of positionally limited and he's very yeah. inconsistent. He is, They're and he hasn't player. been good this year for sure. The the best player on their team is the milf slayer, Bo Bichette. <laughs> uh, he is like. What? That's what like that was is like that his nickname, the that, Milf Slayer? Yeah, that was like the running joke when he was in like in high school. Is like oh, I, all I these bet. Florida moms just thought he was the greatest thing ever. You know, well, the I'm long sure, hair. I'm sure. You know, I'm so. sure those Florida moms ate him up, man. Yeah. So oh. that's what somebody. I don't remember one of his teammates or somebody oh. called him that. Oh. Well, like, you know, like he, I, they could do it. I mean, I don't know that they Mariners going to go that route completely, but they should look, you know, whether it's first base, it's a corner outfield spot, you know, I mean, they should upgrade a backup catcher too, if he can, just to get uh -huh. another guy in there. I mean, I don't know. It, the, the, win, the one thing is your roster because you have Garver, you're positionally limited a little bit. Right. Because you have that. And so, but the one thing you, you can, you can just adjust the playing time because you have, you know, Ty Fran or because you have Dylan Moore and you have some other guys that are versatile, you can adjust the playing time. You know, okay. Like when JP comes back, you'll have Dylan Moore. You'll bring in a guy, then you can play Luke Rayley there because he doesn't have to finish the game at first base. Put in Ty for defensive purposes. You know, it's the same thing they do. I mean, like you remember when some of the, <laughs> when they had Winker in left field, they couldn't run Dylan Moore out there fast enough in the seventh inning of a one run game. It was like, like, out there. I mean, before they could even say, "Hey, hey, Dylan, you're in," like Dylan was running out. Like, yeah, I think like I, I caught him at times where they both were running out together, and I then think, Winker realized, oh, I don't, I'm not going to play. Now. I think Robbie Ray was the one telling him, hey, why don't you go out there, Dylan? <laughs> Here's you for defense. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm going to step in right now before Skip says something, but you're not you're not going to play in left field. I, I think okay? Winker and Abe Toro have the, would have highest OPSs on the team right now if they were on the Mariners. Abraham Toro's killing it. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, and that's what, you know, what's so frustrating as a fan is I sit there and I look at, I just was looking at like Oakland's offensive stats. Like they're, they're better in every statistical category than the Mariners um, on everything. And I'm like, that team is the modern Cleveland Indians of major league. Yeah. Well, they're literally just like thrown together and it's better than what you thought you were acquiring or wanted to acquire, like in this championship window. God, that is just depressing. Yeah. It's, I was looking at the twins. It's like the, how they reduced the strikeouts is you got rid of Joey Gallo and Michael K. Taylor, not Michael A. Taylor and yeah. Donovan Solano. And then by running the platoons, you're not putting these players in as many situations where they, they do punch out. You know, like I, I think, I think you look at the, the third base platoon, it's worked out pretty well. I mean, Arias isn't, he's in a no. world beater. I mean, you could go find a right-handed bat to play third and use Rojas to move him around too. But like, um, I think that's been fine because you're using them in a position of strength. The The problem is, is like the guys that you feel are everyday players have been really exposed. You know, and, and again, like, yeah, it's tough that Hanager isn't is striking out more than normal, but he's kind of still put the power numbers up that he can. And Garver hasn't been great, but it's the center fielder. It's the center fielder. It's yeah. always, the, that's the answer. Like even in the game that they won, he had four hit or he had three hits and he was on base and he made stuff happen. You know, it's like, it's the center fielder. When he goes, they go. Yeah, absolutely. All right. It's uh it's mother's day this weekend. You, you got a, you got a good mother's day story. You got a good mom driving you around everywhere as a kid, all your sporting events, uh, everything. No, not really. That's more I mean, dad. No, I we had a bike, small town. Just I had a bike. bike. What's mom? Does mom still nag you about something? What does mom still nag you about? My mom is a little Japanese lady who's totally OCD. It, like everything impossible, she nags me about. I mean, like it's you know it's because I don't. She always thinks that I'm a messy person, which I am, but not that bad. So she's always like, "Well, are you cleaning up after yourself?" 
Are you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, my mom would be the person in here cleaning off the tables inside this, in the, in this lounge. Okay. She just couldn't take it. You know, the, uh, the begging for grandkids that aren't going to come. Oh, she's given up on that dream a long time ago. What's the, what's the, you go back, you go back to Montana. What is she, is she, does she have a, a go-to meal for her son? Do you oh. ask her, Hey, can you make this? And I come home. Can you please have this ready? Yeah, she makes homemade chicken fried steak that is better than the five spot. Oh, Lord. It's unbelievable. Really? It's unbelievable. And home, she's got the gravy with it. She don't, I don't need gravy with that. It's that good. The flavor is that good. And then she has this like cheesy hash brown casserole that she makes with it. And then corn on the cob. Well, what does she do with corn on the cob? Like just right? to have with it. Oh, know, okay. She just has to make some special version of corn on the cob, right? Yeah, no, but it's just like these. It's just good to have with it. God, that's she good. knows I don't eat anything green. I don't eat green no green, vegetables. no green for divish. I hate, I hate vegetables. You're the Al Michaels of baseball. I hate salad. I don't even okay. put lettuce on my burgers or sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you are peak physical shape best in shape reporter in seattle it's not a high bar to climb by any means but yeah it is not you are correct on that one you are you are you are 100 correct all right enjoy the rest of your afternoon in the united airlines lounge yeah safe travels back to seattle Let's good luck this alaska flight the door stays on and it takes off that's all yeah there, you shout out to alaska <laughs> hopefully the door stays on i think it will Good luck battling the traffic with the president, and uh, we'll be following along as you cover the uh, Oakland Athletics coming into town. Thank yeah. you, Davish. If I have to spend a lot of time in seat 33C, I'm not going to be happy. I went from 7A to 33C. <laughs> Godspeed to the person and the people next to you. Yes. Godspeed exactly. to them. There he is, Ryan Davish, Seattle Times, all brought to you by Chalet Bowl. Visit ChaletBowl.com. <laughs>